let us continue our journey, dear friends, through the world of tefillah, of prayer. That's where we are. We started last class with a beginning. Let's have a look at, now remember, let's just recap. We are starting the semester by discussing prayer as talking to God. Forget the Siddur, forget your Machzor, all of that stuff are much later creations. They were created because something was lacking, something was missing, and that thing went missing, we're going to see, because of bad things, including Galut, exile of the Jewish people. But that's not where we are right now. Right now we're going back to basics of what exactly is this thing which we refer to as prayer, but is better referred to as tefillah, as tefillah. That's what we're going to be trying to figure out today. And today we're going to try to figure out the parameters of this mitzvah itself. Let's have a look at a pasuk from the Torah. Now this event we're about to look at occurred before the Jewish people even received the Torah. So that means prayer, and we're going to see this a few times, predates Judaism. Right? Because Judaism began at Harasenai in the Jewish year 2448, which is 3,333 years ago. So we're going to see that prayer goes way before that. And the story is told of the Jewish people leaving Egypt. And we know that Paro and his choicest soldiers and chariots chased after the Jewish people. Or Paro Hikriv, we're on page three, those who are following. The Yisu B'nai Israel and the children of Israel raised up their eyes. Vene, and behold, Mitzrayim Nisach Rehem, the Egyptians were chasing after them. The Yirumaod, they got very, very scared. The Itzaku, and they shouted out, Bene Israel, El Hashem, to God. Makes sense. There they are. They're trapped. In front of them was the Yam Suf, behind them were the Mitzrayim. To the right and left was a barren and hostile and very scary desert. They were trapped! They had nowhere to go! What do they do? They screamed out, Bitsaku. Rashi makes a fascinating explanation. Let's look at this Rashi together, and he is going to explain this idea and the Every word of this Rashi is mwah, delicioso. There's a lot happening in this Rashi and we're going to break down a little bit and we're going to double click on some of these words later on in the semester. But if you want to know one Rashi on prayer, boom! This is it. Says Rashi, Divra Maskil Vitsaku, they scream now. What do they scream now? Right? What do they scream? What do they scream? Says Rashi. Tafsu Umnut Avotam. They grabbed on in Russia. The umnut. The umnut of Otam of their forefathers. What's that? What's this? They grabbed onto the. What's an umnut? An umnut, if you're Russian, What's an umnut? It's an omen. Like but you're, you're... The concepts or like ideology or like like what they thought like whatever they did to get through the bad or like the moments where they felt alone or like this that's that they could cry what, what they did that's what we're gonna do that's so definitely for sure for one word but you're getting there very good you're right go on, go on. Uh, I don't know what else we could say about this other than like Okay, it does. You're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. Very, very good. But that's a showrish play of words. It's true, and it is. It is. Okay. It's gonna relate to what emuna. We're gonna see that connection. But for now, it's a a trade. 
a profession, if you will. Or as we translate them here, the craft, the skill. You have an umnut. What's your profession? What do you do? Umnut. This is our profession, says Rashi. Well, how do they know to do this? They were slaves coming out of Egypt. Because we had a tradition that went back from our forefathers, says Rashi. They didn't just make it up. It didn't come out of nowhere. What is the idea of turning to God at times of extreme trouble, trial, and tribulation? Oh, says Rashi. They had a tradition which had been passed down from Avraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov and Sarah and Rivka and Rachel and Leah and all the other great Jewish heroes and heroines, although they were Jewish at this point, Ivrim, that preceded them. And he's going to expand more. Well, how do you know that Avraham did this? Who says they learned it from them? But Avraham Omer, El Hamakom Asher Ahmad Sham. Remember that? There's a passage that says Abraham stood in Amida, Ella Tefillah. Standing in Amida is a code word for a type of prayer. So they knew that Abraham spoke to God. Be Yitzchak Lesuch Basadeh. Yitzchak, we said, meditated in the afternoon. Abraham, we said, last class was in the morning. Yitzchak was in the afternoon. The Yaakov, Yitzchak Makom. He reached the place and he prayed over there. So there was a tradition, because there was no Torah at this point had been given. But there was a tradition that was passed down, which was eventually codified into the Torah, that the forefathers and the foremothers prayed. They prayed. And actually, it uses different words to describe the different prayers of Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov because their prayers were different. They had different relationships with Hashem. Okay? So we're going to see many stories in the Torah. Actually, one of the reasons the Torah does not begin with a mitzvot, right? And Har Sinai is because everything that happens to the avot, masa avot, simen labanim. What happened to our forefathers is a sign for us too. So all these stories that we're going to see, and Avram's going to do that. He's going to pray for Abimelech. He's going to pray for Sodom and Amorah. Right? He's going to love pray. All this stuff. And Yitzhak's going to pray for kids. And Ruth's going to pray for kids. And Sarah's going to pray. And Avram and everyone's praying. Well, where did that from? I mean, Adam Rishon is going to pray too. He's going to do Teshuvah. The concept of Teshuvah goes back to the expulsion from Gan Eden. That's also a form of prayer, isn't it? Praying to God that he forgives you for your sins. It's all prayer, isn't it? I mean, even if you think about it just that way, prayer isn't even a Jewish thing. Because it didn't start as a mitzvah in the Torah. It is going to be a mitzvah in the Torah, we're going to see. But it starts as being a great... That means human condition is to pray. And God listens to the prayers of all people, no matter what nation, if they speak to God. Are you with me? The fact this comes up before our Sinai means that it's not exclusive to the Jewish people. If it was, it would just be given to us. Okay. Yeah. So each one of them a different word. El Makomesh Ahmad is Abraham. Yisrael is Suach Sicha, conversing with God, and Yaakov is Vayifga. He met God but Makom in that place. Pegia. There's going to be I think ten different expressions for Tefillah that we're going to look at. And each one of them is unique, and they're all available to us. And when it says they did, that means Avram is, and we said Avram is morning, and we said Yit, that's Shachar, and Yitzchak is afternoon, right? Mincha, and Yaakov is nighttime, and uh, Yaakov is nighttime, by Mariv or Erev. And it represents who they were. Because Avram, if you were, was the morning, he created the idea of godliness, talking to God, right? He referred to God as Adon, the first one ever. Yitzchak is all about hard work, that's the afternoon, that's Yitzchak. Right? And Yaakov is Erev nighttime because that's the darkest time. That represents Galut, prayer in Galut. So each one of them is going to have their own thing. That means, huh. we look at our Sidurim. I should mention Sidurim, but I don't want to talk about it. But you see the same prayer. But when I say those words, it's, it should be very different when you say them. When you ask for help, it's different to me asking for help. When you ask for Parnassah, that's different for me asking for Parnassah. So it looks the same. 
that's one of the reasons we're going to see when we get at the end of the semester, we're going to go through the Amidah. We start the Amidah with Elokei Abraham, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov. Why doesn't it say Elokei Avraham Yitzchak and Yaakov? Why does it say the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? All right, that'll be a much smarter thing to say. Why does it say the God of the God of? Because each one of them had their own relation to God. Although they were family, grandfather, father, and son, each one of them relates to God in a different way. Even when you say the same words, which we're about to do, God's reminding us, the rabbis actually, because the Amida is a rabbinic creation, are telling us, although you're saying the same words as every other Jew, at the same time, the kavanah, the intention, makes it a completely different prayer. It's a very personal thing. Are we together so far? Okay. Any questions? Let's move on. Let's jump forward a little bit because soon after this we receive the Torah. So the question is, is there a mitzvah to pray? Are you obligated? And if there is a mitzvah, how do you do it? I mean, there's a mitzvah to put on tefillin. How do you do that? A mitzvah to put a mezuzah on your doorpost. How do you do that? Stick on the doorpost. Mitzvah to eat matzah. How do you do that? You eat it. Mitzvah to shofar. We'll all be doing that mitzvah next week. How do we do that? Shut up and listen. Pretty simple. Is there a mitzvah to pray? It sounds like a lot. Of course there is. Who says? And if there is, how do you do it? What do you have to say? Is there a formula? Is it one hour a day? Is it 10 hours a day? Anybody know? Anyone have any thoughts on this? Well, let's start with Is there a mitzvah to pray to God? Okay, so you're saying there is a, it's an optional mitzvah. Yeah, you want to do it. It's a positive mitzvah. It's not like it's not a command. For I think actually, I think for like men, it is a command. But for women, it's like a like since it's not a time. No, but it is time. I don't know. So I wanted something to do with all that stuff. I don't okay, see, so once again, Anya, you covered many, many areas. Yeah. But you did say something interesting. Do. Is it a time-bound mitzvah? Is it a mitzvah? It is. Shizman, grama. If it is a time-bound mitzvah. You people over here are not obligated in it. Because women, for the most part, are not obligated in mitzvah shazman grama. By the way, just, spoiler alert, you are all obligated to pray, by the way. It is a mitzvah, not an optional one. It's a mitzvah chiyubit. You must pray. Okay? Why? We have to figure out. Yes, Ms. Green. Um, wouldn't brachos be a mitzvah? Mitzvah, uh, brachot are a mitzvah. Uh, they are rabbinic mitzvah, but um, they're a form of prayer. Yeah, but why? Who says that? Maybe it's, they're optional. So tell me why. I'm going to. I want to hear you first. I want you, sounds weird. I want you to think a little bit and give some answers. Let's try to let's try to process it. Yes. Are you asking why or, or why we are oh are we obligated to pray? It's a mitzvah. Well, I, to address the um, time balance. Yeah. Women are still obligated, just in also time-bound way that men are, but it's still, it's like we're still here. Let's, let's have a look at the Pasuk and the Rambam, just to get this nice and clear, because when I get this piece, it ain't gonna happen. It says in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verse 13, the Vavrim Yudalaf Yudgim, Vaya im shemot el mitzvotai, if you are careful to follow my mitzvot, I share anochi mitzvot hayom that I command today la ahava. Woo! That's getting fancy. To love et Hashem alokechem, the Lord your God, ula avdo, and to serve Him b'chol avchem with all your hearts, plural, b'chol nafshchem and with all your soul. Says the Rambam. Hello. You didn't realize. You got yourself a mitzvah. Min ha Torah. Mitzvah ase. There is a positive mitzvah. Lehit palel. To pray. Bochol yom. Every day. Ooh, now that's important, isn't it? Every day. He didn't say just Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Right? 
like most Jews, are they? No, no, no! They're not, not everyone's gonna agree with this piece of, everyone agrees that it's mitzvah, say, from the Torah. The Rambam's gonna say, though, a little differently, the Rambam, this is Maimonides, he said, every single day, you have a mitzvah to pray. Shnei Mar, as it says, you should serve the Lord your God. We learn from Shmuel means we hear, but it means from the oral tradition. Okay, from the Gemara. Lamdu sha'avodazu hitafila. Code word, code word, and the code word is a o da. Work. Work, 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 work. That is a word, or maybe a better word is service. But it's interesting, because there's another word you can use for work that is used in the Torah and by the rabbis, which is malacha. Malacha is creative. It's interesting, and I've always thought about this, that the word that the Hashem uses, the Torah uses to describe tefillah is avodah. Avodah, by the way, is hard, back-breaking work. Like avodim hayinu, Laparo and Mitzrayim. That's interesting. Okay, the rabbis do speak about this idea that it's it's hard work. It's not an easy mitzvah. Actually, I believe it to be one of the hardest mitzvahs. Um, actually, not taking revenge is probably harder, but we'll leave that aside. Shnei Mar, Ola Avda Bachal Abavchem, you should serve the Lord your God with all your heart. Amru Chachamim, the rabbis in the Gemara, in Tanit tell us, Eizuhi Avod Hashabalev. What is service of the heart? Now we're adding a body part all of a sudden. What is this avodah? She'balev. What is the service of the heart? He tefillah. It is tefillah. With which part of your body do you pray? You would have thought your mouth, your lips. That's not completely accurate. It is your lave, your heart. Avodah she'balev. That is how prayer is referred to, service of your heart. Heart, we said, connotes the emotional connection. Right? That's why your heart speeds up when you get emotional. Right? The emotional, the emotional, but also, but also, we said the heart is, we went a little bit deeper, represents the part of the soul that is the ruach, the spirit which lies between the nefesh and the neshama. Did we say that in this class, last class? No, we, have... I remember hearing that in your other class. No, I remember in this yeah, class. We said in this class or the other class? No, not this class. Oh dear, oops, <laughs> sorry. Yikes. Okay, let's do that very quickly. Although we're gonna do it again. We know, or maybe you don't, and that's okay. And if you don't know it, you're in the right place. And we have to, work, we have to use the word fill out as well. Oh, and the word umnut. A lot to do. Oh, we've got a lot to do. So we know that we have a nefesh, and that's the lowest level of soul. Which, if you're interested, is found in the blood. Yeah, we mentioned the other class. We did that's right. Between that, we have the ruach, which is the spirit, which is found in the heart. Then we have the neshama, which is the go-to term. Actually, in Kabbalah, they refer to it as naran, which is the soul, which is found in the brain, the moth. Okay? So we're saying that the heart is the location where prayer comes from. That's interesting. The word ruach actually means wind or air, right? And actually, that's what breath is. Breath is the highest. And this is, this is action. is down here, right? And over here, the soul is thought, because that's the brain. So what's this? Thought, action, and speech. That's why animals do not have a ruach. They have a nefesh. That's why animals cannot speak. That I mention this because the highest level of speech makes sense is prayer talking to God. So that's the highest manifestation of the ruah of speech. Wait, so 
Action, thought, and speech. That's your one-on-one -on -one in Kabbalah. Yeah? Does that make sense? So speech, so tefillah comes from the heart. That means it's actually, if you want to go a little bit deeper, it comes from the ruach. We're going to do this again. I'm Wait, just running through this. This is all the Neshama and Nefesh. Neshama is brain. No, soul. Soul is in the brain. And then what about the Nefesh? Blood. Nefesh, keep. Down in Nefesh. Yeah, this Nefesh. So they're both in... in this is in the blood. But there's a soul. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually Nefesh Bahamut, the animal soul. It's really the technical term for that one. Yeah? Kabbalah 101 done? So when you pray, you're actually, you're connect, when you speak actually in general, you're connecting body and soul. Right? Your Neshama and your Nefesh. It comes through here. This is how you manifest these two. Just a bit of a background, so you have it. Good? Marvelous. So that's the Ramba. What is Avodah Shabalev? Mitzvah to pray. So let's go back to our earlier question. Is there a mitzvah for women to pray? Women are not obligated in time, bow mitzvah. Most of them. There are exceptions. Pesach, because women were involved in that redemption, and Hanukkah they are because they were involved in that redemption, right? And Shabbat, because Shamor of Zachor, and other reasons, they're obligated to know the mitzvah. But are women obligated? It's a positive mitzvah. I was going to ask, is there a difference between a positive mitzvah and a positive mitzvah? And a. Well, what do you mean by the word commandment? Like if someone's not obligated to do something, but it's. Is, are there optional mitzvah? Yeah. We're saying, is it an optional mitzvah? Is it. Yeah. Or is it a chiyuv? Do you have to do it? According to the Rambam, you do. Every day. He doesn't. Exactly. It's not a time bar mitzvah. Therefore, women are obligated, and men, and we all are. Everyone is obligated to talk to God. What do you say? Doesn't tell us. When do you say it? Doesn't tell us. How you say it? It doesn't tell us. Just talk it to God. And as a, on a basic Torah level, you fulfill which is where we are right now, because we're at the mitzvah stage now, you fulfill the mitzvah by just, thank you, Hashem. Right, you wear the bracelet, get the t-shirt, maybe the sweater, you know, the T-Y-H, I don't right, You just say that. Just say a couple of, maybe making one bracha would fulfill that. Yeah? Now the rabbi's going to add a lot more to it. Right? But that's the way it is. Are we good? So it's a mitzvah for everyone just to talk to God. Yeah. You excited about that? No, I, I'm keeping this thing on here. Nope. So Marvelous. Sure. Don't give this book away. One day you'll revisit it. I trust me. Rabbi, I still have one from holidays and the PDF. I still have students from years ago telling me they go through it and they still have the books and they uh, use it to teach their kids. It's all good. Okay. And the Rambam is going to go a little bit deeper. He's going to be like, fine. Let me break down the mitzvah with you a little bit more. Okay? And this is in the laws of tefillah, right? Which appears in the Mishnah Torah. Hilchot tefillah. Chayev, chiyuv mitzvah zu. So how do we actually fulfill this mitzvah? Kachu, shia adam mitchanen u mitpalel v'chol yom. Every single day, you've got to talk to God. U magid shifcho, Let's break it down. He's going to break it down into three compartments, okay? Which the rabbis, we're going to see, did for us and put inside the Amida into the Shmona Esrei, which we're going to spend some time discussing this semester. He's like, he broke it down and put it into three categories. So how do you fulfill it? He goes, part one of prayer is... Shevach. Praise. You praise God. That's number one. Umagit shivcha shal hakadosh baruch. V'yakach v'yachakach, and only after that, Shoel tzerachav. We call ba'kasha asking for your 
needs. Ask me for your needs. That's number two. Okay? Number one, you praise God. Number two is what's called back a shot in the pool. You ask God to start. He's like, don't start with that. You don't start asking. You're going to be like my kids. You don't say, I hope I can have any of your shoes. Yeah, I'll pay them. First, you're like, you're the best father. You're the best mother. Wow. I could not have asked for better parents. You're the best. Mom, dad, Emma, Abba. What would I do without you? I don't thank you enough. You're just the best. Now, I need uh, the Amazon account to be opened again. I know I overspent a little bit. because That's what I'm saying. It sounds a little self-serving. So we have to analyze that. And number three is Hoda'a. Hoda'a, says the Rambam. Ve'chakach. Not in Shevach va Hoda Hodaya is this. Hodaya. Not just a ring and bracelet engraver in Jerusalem. Which everyone's obsessed with here this day, right? Hodaya. You give thanks. Thank you, Hashem. Now even that's hard to understand. What do you thank you for? Who says you got part two? Right. Wait, wait, Please, Hashem, let the meeting go well today. Thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Nimfo. Have you happened yet? Yeah? Father Shaduf. Thank you. Because I really thank you that has happened yet. Yeah? So we've got to say, well, that's doing over there as well. It says the Ramah, those are three parts. Now we're going to see the Amida is divided into three sections. The first section which is the first three brachot, which are actually one, you see, is praise. The second grouping, which is 12, right? 13, 14, 16, 18, actually now it's 13. One was added, we'll see who added it, why they added it. The first bracha, the Amidah, is gonna be praise, okay? Now the Ramadan talk talking about the Amidah. It's just when they made the Amidah, the rabbis, they didn't follow the Rambam. The Rambam is following the formula, which we know of three things. First, you have to praise Hashem. Then you have to ask for stuff. And then we have the modem section of the Amidah, which is the thank you. This first section and third section are always there and always the same for every Amidah. The middle section is different depending on where you are in the calendar, right? Shabbat is different. And, but every, even the Musaf, which we'll see later on, is going to follow the same book because that is the formula of the Rambam. Well, the Rambam's telling us, explain to us that formula. Okay. By the way, how do we answer that first question I mentioned? Is it a little self-serving? Right? First of all, praise God, then ask if you want to. Right? If my kids do that, I'm like, come on, I see through you. I mean, still get whatever they want, so it's irrelevant. But is that a bit self-serving? No? A little bit? Praising God and asking? Doesn't God see through that? So, so it brings you closer, so it affects you. Well, what? It kind of affects you by just saying it. Okay. Yeah. I feel like it's like for yourself, so like you you're aware that these things aren't just given to you, like they're privileges, and like yeah, you don't have to necessarily literally ask for it, but it's like a good reminder. Ask for what? Whatever. You do. Yeah, because you have to ask for it. What? Because you have to ask for it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what did you say? I said, what are you asking for? Your stuff. Yeah. So you're starting with praise so that you are self-aware, you're saying. Right. You're saying very similar to what Maytel. So Anya? I'm adding to that. I agree with that. But what I want to say is I feel like when you have to praise first, you like, like or not you, like when someone's like about to pray, like they probably have a lot of things that they personally need in mind that they're going to talk to them about. And then the first thing they have to do is praise him and they'll realize, oh wait, I already have that. Without, without, without knowing, you're actually answering a little bit about the word tefillah means, which yeah. you have to define as well. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. 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 I just think it's the only order that really makes sense. Like, 
like if it was in any other order, you'd be like, any other wouldn't makes work. No sense. Thank you. Then ask for stuff. That make, that would make sense. Then praise. Yeah. That would make sense. Ask me for stuff. Then praise and thank you. Yeah. Would make sense. So why does it make sense? Um, Back up your words. Yeah. No, I mean it's just like sandwiching bakashah in between like talking to God in a more respectful way. So if okay. you kind of put it at the top or put it at the bottom, you would be starting with it or ending with it, and that's what your full focus would be instead of like intentionally starting with something and ending with something. That's more respectful. Good. I like it. Yeah. I think you're all saying the same thing in different ways and very good ways. We start with praise because of the rabbis. We need to know who we're talking to. In other words, you know what? Let's just break, let's make it really simple. Let me give you a three point formula when it comes to all prayer. And I wish everyone knew this. Okay? Just, I don't know if I mentioned this last class. I did, I apologize, I'll say it again. Just pray. No matter what you say. Just talking to God. When, whatever it is, you're actually admitting three things, are you not? One, there's a God. Two, God listens. And three, God can do something about my needs. These three. One, there's a God. Two, God's listening. Three, God can do something about my needs. Just open your mouth in prayer. Otherwise, if there's no God, why am I asking? And if God doesn't listen to us mortal humans, who are you speaking to? And if God can't do something about my needs, then why am I asking God? So, built into this whole prayer thing, is something which is an absolute recognition there's a God. And I was, what are you asking? Why are you asking God? If you don't believe in God, it makes no sense. You must have these three just by opening your mouth. These three come into effect. What we call, and which is not discussed enough, which is why for the first time in my life, I actually started doing a series in Manhattan on this. God bless you, God bless you. Which is a course I started doing on Emunah on building faith. We're going to see that a major part, if not reason, for prayer isn't just this. There's a standalone piece, which is this. Building Emunah, which happens not coincidentally, we're going to see, to be connected to Umnut, to a profession, and to the word which we're going to spend a couple of classes discussing, a very important word, Amen. Amen, Emona, Umnut. Sisters, they're all related. They are all related. So this praise thing isn't just like, oh, it's like, well, do you know what you're doing? Right? You're talking to the creator of the universe who created everything, who created you, who knows everything, who knows your thoughts, your most intimate ideas, everything about God who created you. I'm like, what? Well, now I know I'm talking to, that changed the conversation. Because I'm asking one of my friends, I mean, I can ask stuff and thank a friend, but praising that, giving shavach, that opens up a whole new vista of understanding. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, I'm talking to the creator of the universe. I'm standing before the Melech Malchim and Lachim at Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's pretty big stuff. And we're going to see in the formula of Brachot, I'm not even talking the, th I'm talking the one on one. Panim al Panim. I mean, you've got to just download that, that into your heads just a little bit, into your cerebellus. That speaks up. We are being told that you can have a direct conversation with God. You want to do teshuva? Don't go to the rabbi and tell him all of your sins. Please don't. People don't want to do that. I don't want to hear your sins. I've done enough of mine. You know what I'm saying? I don't need to hear your, your sort of details. Talk to, you have a direct line with God. You don't need to go through anybody else. Right? Do it yourself. I don't really want to go for a bracha. 
Talk to God yourself. This wasn't kept for the rabbis or the priests. They may have a certain different access point. Praying for someone does work, we're going to see. Even Avram Avinu was asked to pray on behalf of Avimelech and it worked in order to heal him. So dear, praying for someone else is a good thing. But you have a direct line. And this prayer thing isn't just to get you stuff. Which it is as well. I'm not going to lie to you. The Gemara is going to tell us that you're meant to pray for everything. When I, you, you get a bad back. And then like, oh my, I got a headache. Oh please, I should, I should pray for it. There is nothing too small and nothing too big. Is Ramban, sorry, is Ramban referring to a woman's obligation? Uh, he's going to, but over here he's saying everyone has an obligation, yeah. Okay. Thousand percent. So is women's obligation, in this case, the praise request? Same thing. Exact, just like you have the same mitzvah of Shabbat, you can make Kiddush, you have other people do it for you, Nerot, I've done absolutely exactly the same. There is no difference. No difference. I don't think so. You heard differently? I don't, I don't see why not. This is the formula. He's all to God. You praise. Now, could you fulfill the mitzvah on a Torah level just by just talking to God? Probably. But he's giving you the best formula. Yeah. Uh, God is listening. Right? God listens to us. I mean, that's the presupposition. You've got to say this. You can analyze it. Yeah. So this idea of emunah, so let's click on the first one, is a big part. The best way, we also about emunah, that's the we're building our faith in God. The best way, I mean, there's many, but one of the best ways to build emunah, which actually means to build a relationship with God, we talk about having a relationship, is to pray. If you're talking, how do you build a relationship with a friend or a spouse, right, a family? You talk to them, get into conversation, get to know them. The more I know about you, right? Okay, wait, I have a question. So, this, this don't even put it the wrong way, but like, when you are in a relationship with someone, like, you need, like, time apart from them, and like, you know, like, it's a lot, like, like in, in a sense, like, it is a lot to think, like, well, like, to pray three times a day, like, I don't even talk to my mom that often, you know, like... Oh, my God, you got mad. No, there's busy people. Wow. Like, you know what I'm saying? No, like, that's not the reason. Like, like I fine. love dotting, don't get me wrong, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is, like, what if one day you're just, like, like you know how sometimes you're just, like, in the nicest way, not in the mood to talk to a yeah. certain friend? Like, what if one day you're just, like, not feeling it? Is that, Such like, a great question. You know, no, no, you're, like, you're jumping way ahead, but yes, it's such an important question. No, don't apologize. It's a beautiful question. That's like where it's like, you know, like sometimes it's Sunday morning, I'm tired, I'm in. You know, it's like a little harder because I don't have to get up early already. And like, you know, like... I hear you. Like, what if I don't have to get up early already? You know, like... I hear you. Yeah. I'd like to give an answer, but there's a lot there. It's fine. So I'm just addicted to soda. I apologize. It's terrible. Okay. I know. Don't okay. judge me. I know. I know. I know. Especially the dive. I know. Sprite's a little better. I know. Tastes good. I'm not going to. I know. You should make it yourself. So it's good. Make my own Coke. <laughs> Probably illegal. You can make your own Coke. I mean, Rabbi you found making Coke. It wouldn't sound good. In the <laughs> I got enough bad publicity. I don't do that as well. Okay, I want to ask you a question. You asked a very good question. Let's see you're not in the mood. So the answer happens to be, do it anyway. And I was, you're, you're obligated, I understand. You're in the obligation. It doesn't say all day. It says obligation to me. Now, we spoke about the Hasidim Rosh and There were people who used to pray one hour for every Amidah, which we said seven seconds in each word, which means they prayed nine hours a day. Yeah, we're not that level. We're not that level. But, you're right. And there's people who would wait 24 hours to meet the milk. And no such obligation. Oh my God, I would yeah. agree. So that we understand, we understand that. It doesn't mean the idea is not there. You pray as much as you are connected to, but you have to pray. And maybe, I'm just mentioning it, you may not like this, the more you don't want to do the mitzvah, the more reward you get. Lufum tsara agra. And maybe the prayer is, I don't want to talk to you right now, Hashem. That's also a prayer, by the way. I say, Hashem, just give me the will because I don't feel it. And we all don't feel it sometimes, let's be honest. Give me the greatest rabbi, oh, there we go. Right? That doesn't mean it could be that that prayer is worth more in Hashem's eyes. And someone's like, "Woo, mo da ani le fan." And I'm saying, right? <laughs> because you're putting more effort into it. The fun sa agra. 
could be. You're like, I just don't do this right now, but I'll do it anyway. I don't want to help my, you know, my wife do something, but I, this is my obligation. I've got to do it. And there's more effort that's needed. It could be. I don't know. Hashem decides. But can't doing that sometimes push someone away from it? I don't know. I think sometimes saying, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway, it could be that they get more schaf. Me going to every class inside doors. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm not going to come in. But I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, it could well be. I'm just putting it as an idea. Right? Everyone thinks, well, I'll only pray when I feel like it. It's a mitzvah. Right? It's a mitzvah. And by the way, people go through tremendous challenge. The Ramban is going to disagree and say the only time it's a mitzvah doraita is when you are in times of trouble and difficulty with like the Jewish people at the Yam Suf. We're going to see the Ramban, Nachman, he's going to say the only time it's a real mitzvah doraita is when people turn to Hashem. So by the way, if you, I don't really get that because all of life is trouble and challenge. The Ramban is going to say the real time that the mitzvah of the tefillah kicks in, mitzvah doraita, is when a person is in trouble. Or a challenge. Uh, what's the mitzvah Torah? A Torah mitzvah, obligation, obligation from the Torah. Aren't the yeah. Like, isn't that... well, I mean, on a personal level, we're always in trouble. Yeah, so. yeah. but it means a person's in personal trouble. It means you know they're up against a major challenge. Okay, we're working through this. This is good. We're formulating ideas over. It. Let's have a look at Moshe Feinstein. So we've jumped a few thousand years, but I, I mention it because. This praise thing has to be figured out. And he says, Zel ikar he'muna We will talk about belief, right? Actually, belief isn't a good word. It's not even a Jewish concept. We don't believe. We know we are faithful to Hashem. Belief is blind. I don't know, so I believe. Emunah is actually learning from the past from your own personal past and the historical past and having faith in God based upon those events if you want to talk about faith in God the better word is bitachon and that's a reference to things that have not happened yet I have faith that I will find a shidduch I have faith that I will pass Rabbi Hadjof's class I have any more than faith I have faith that I'm going to get that job whatever it is so emunah it's better translated as faithful to what I know. Betachon is building faith in God based on emunah. You need emunah first about things in the future. I don't understand the difference between faith and belief. Belief isn't really... Although we use the word belief to define emunah. Belief is, I don't know, do you believe that I'm 49? I mean, can you believe that? Right? Or do you know it? Right. Or do you have faith in it? You know, believe it. It's just... So faith is more trusting. Bitachon is trusting. Emunah is being faithful to what is already known. You see the word emunah? That's really what it is. Based upon what you personally know or the rabbis have shown us. So emunah is faithful. Based upon that, what you know. Or what is known. Do you mean faithful? You don't want to get what I'm saying over here? I'm covering a lot over here. No, I like it. Emunah... Emunah, it's good. Please, you're asking me. Well, that's not. That's kind of related. To this. Emunah is things have happened in my personal life that I know. I'm building up my connection to God. Or things have happened in Jewish history. Like we have emunah. Torah is given at Mount Sinai. What's the English translation for that? I'm the better. We use the word belief or faith. But I'm saying it's not technically correct. It's being faithful to what you know. Okay, so emunah is faithful. Being faithful is actually. Betachon is things that is trusting in God for the future. Yeah. That is how Rabbi Chazan Ish has a whole book in it called Fun Love Emunah Betachon. They're two different things. You're only going to trust God in the future based upon things that have happened in the past. We're saying you can build Emunah and actually Betachon, because the two are connected, they overlap, by praying to God. And by seeing stories of great people praying to God that I personally didn't witness, but I'm hearing about, I'm like, wow, my Emunah is invigorated through those stories. Abraham who prayed and was asked. Abraham who had the, Right? So I build my emunah. I, my emunah can grow hearing about your stories of prayer and God and miracles. That builds emunah. So it first comes knowledge. But knowledge is never enough. You can know and do nothing about it. 
then you build a relationship with God, and then you have bitachon. Prayer helps. Well, actually, all of them. Right. That makes sense. Does that make it? Are you following me? That's the so Rav Moshe finds it in saying he didn't make this idea up that prayer is actually really the best way you have to build emunah and Hashem and bitachon. Yeah, even if it's not your own personal stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Do we know things? Yeah, you can know things. There are things that are known. But quite, and that's not even so difficult. Right? Um, let me ask you, do you know that smoking is bad for you? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You can know, you can, or as the rabbis put, it gives you permission to believe. Huh? As rabbi. Uh, mm-hmm. So but it's not 100%. But you know. It can never be 100% because then you lose free will. Right. It's always good. That's why every miracle in the Torah always has a natural explanation. There's always a natural phenomena that comes up. This is more to do with, it's not really to do with our class. It's another discussion of why every miracle in the Torah, right through the Bible, Nach, in Tanakh, you look through, there's always a natural explanation. There's always a wind, right? East the wind that came before Kriyat Yam Suf, the splitting of the sea, right? When Elisha did miracle, and Leo did miracle, they always was, they didn't come out, they had to have a little bit of oil that became more oil. Because otherwise, it just popped out of nowhere, then our free will be affected. So there's always a natural, it may be small, but there's always got to be some area of doubt. Every one of the makot, right? In Mitzrayim, the, 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 Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron always had to do something. Right? To throw sand up, they had to do some. Well, the makot were miracles? They were miracles. They were miracles, but there was always a physical act that happened, it had to come from something, so it always left a little bit of doubt, so those people who believe it came from God are rewarded. If it's really just clearly, God just popped out of nowhere, the sea just split with the wind, then you don't get any credit for it. It's got to be... Because you're a believer, oh, very, very good. And for some people they would, and some people they do. But like, sea split, it's a natural, it wasn't God, it's a natural phenomenon. Yeah, that gives a lot of room to those type of people. It does. That's exactly what God does. God always leaves a, a small amount. But isn't letting them stray? Otherwise, you get no lafums out. It's got to be a little bit of effort and action that goes into it. Okay, we're off topic, but it's a good topic, but I want to just... I mean, it's related because it's all about emunah. Prayer is the best way to build emunah. This praise thing, even the asking stuff and the and the thanking, right? It all is, is enveloped over here. So only God, if there is, only God giving you a parnasa. Refua, lacholim to sick people. Okshenu potech alashim is brach. Benamit palel alav. Hare you, keno mamin, bo mamin, bitvar machirem. Basically, if you don't pray, says Rav Moshe, you're not a God believer. One of the pri- That's why prayer isn't limited to Jews. It's not a mitzvah only for Jews. Everyone, every nation prays to God. And by the way, God listens to them. Right? We know that. There are many stories of, can anyone think of a very famous story of entire nations not just praying to God and being listened to? Actually, over the Jewish prophet telling them that God's not going to listen. God drops it. I don't think of a famous story from, Jew, from Jewish history, from Tanakh, actually. We're going to read this story in the next few weeks. Jonah. Right? Jonah. Jonah was a Jewish prophet who lived in Israel. He goes to Nineveh. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Which is modern day Iraq. And he walks in and then he says, Hello, you people, you sinners. God's going to kill you all. And I'm like, Oh no, that's terrible. What should we do? I was like, Nothing. You're all dead. That's it. You're all dead. Jonah said that. Yeah. And they turn around like, it can't be. And they repented. And God listened. And God didn't swim. And God got very upset. He's like, what well, You made my words terrible. You made it terrible for me. They prayed and you listen. And God says, am I going to destroy people for no reason? That's not what I do. I prefer people repent and come back. And do teshuva. Prayer is open to all people. Call our men. Actually, as a side point, since I'm thinking about it, there's a lot going on in here, by the way. 
I have, you know, soundtracks of Jewish plays that my daughters play on the seat, you know, online all the time. I also have this. If you think about it, Rosh Hashanah is actually the new year for all people. Call Boy Ha'olam. Everyone really should be praying Rosh Hashanah. It's not the Jewish New Year, right? That's the beginning of Nisan. It's actually the New Year for all people. Everyone's judged. The entire world is judged. Because it's the creation of mankind, of Adam and Chava, that was celebrating Rosh Hashanah. Not creation of the world. That happened 25th of Elul. We're talking about the creation of mankind. Therefore, everyone's being judged. So every person should pray. And people who, to this day, and I have many people who contact me who are part of the B'nai Noach movement. You know those people? I have a lot of them who actually comment and write to me. These are non-Jewish people who pray. They have prayer services. Talking to God is a multi-universal thing. Yeah. Everyone has to believe in the one true God of Israel even if you're not Jewish. We don't have a monopoly on God and we don't have a monopoly on talking to God. I mean, we could take this even further. This is part of my Mashiach class and I wrote it, I put it in my book. It happens to be that the Yishma'elim, Yishma'el, God listens to the prayers. Right? The Arabs get har habayit and get schut for praying to God. They pray to God a lot. That thing was like, eh, you know, then the gaga. No. And by the way, it's not even a quantity thing. Who says someone prays the entire day Rosh Yom Kippur, hours and hours and hours, and Hashem misses them more than someone who just says one word? We never said that. Who knows? It's not a quantity thing. It's a quality thing. I mean, ideally, you have a little bit of both. All right, but, yeah. For Jews that are atheists, would it be? I'm assuming not, but would it be better for I mean, a Jew who is an atheist, why are they praying? No, that's Doesn't make I'm any saying. sense. So, no, well, what are you doing? Say, let's say like a nun comes, talks to them, and like, they go over there. It would be better for them to go there or to stay atheist. Go where? With the church or... or, no, or yeah. Join the Jewish people and speak to God through... Okay, what if you don't want to? Okay, what are you going to do? So what look, be most Jews don't want to. So would it be better to pray with them or to not to no, no, no. pray with atheists? Uh, they should become part of the Jewish people and uh, follow their own traditions. I mean, it gets complicated now, Islam, Christianity, I mean, it gets complicated. I don't want to go down that route right now. But on a basic level, an important level, every God is every single tefillah. Every single tefillah. It's not easy. And if people are praying against us, that's scary. Very scary. Are you with me so far? We've done a lot today. We've done a lot. Wow. Oof. My brain's full. Okay, let's do a little bit more. Let's do a little bit more, if you don't mind. What time does this class officially finish? I think 11.40. So, oh, we have time. Okay, so that's Rav Moshe Feinstein. And that's why Isaiah the prophet says, there's a method to my Look at what Isaiah says. We have your sum el haraka cheese. We're jumping to the end of history right now. Oof. I'm going to bring them to my holy mountain, usmachtem bevest filati, and they're going to be happy, the place of my prayer. By the way, still don't figure out what the word tefillah means. That's the one word we use to refer to prayer. We don't use sikha really. We use the word amida, but tefillah is going to be the word. That's going to be very important. We have to define what that word means. On the temples of Chaim I'm going to take all their sacrifices. I'm going to spend a bit of this mess talking about sacrifices as well, because they're going to represent tefillah in a big way. Ki beisi, beis tefillah, yikra lochol amim. This temple, now how the temple came around, that's much later. But let's just take it as a given that there's this place where our tefillahs are more readily accepted. Why are we going to see? A number of things. First of all, the Torah is there. Second of all, the sacrifice made over there. Second of all, the Kohanim work over there. Right, second of all, it's in Yerushalayim, which is the Shara Shemaim, the gateway to heaven, as Yaakov revealed to us. So there's a lot when it comes to Jerusalem, we're going to see, and Harabayit. But let's take it as given that even the Mishkan, right, which preceded the temple in Jerusalem, was a place where you had an address to talk to God. 
says Rashi on that piece of Isaiah, the law Yisrael of Adam, not just the Jewish people. Nowadays you go to the Kotel and you see like all these other nations going there. God listens to all prayers of all man. Everyone is obligated to connect to God. Not everyone is obligated in the Tariag Mitzvah. But everyone's obligated to speak to Hashem. So even at the end of the days when the third and final bit of Mitzvah is created, that's why the Gemara says that had the Romans known how much they were losing by destroying the temple, they would never have done it. It was such an important thing even for them. As it says in Perek Avot, Shimon HaTzadik Hayem Shir Kratzak Adolam, Simon the Righteous, was the last of the survivors of the Great Assembly. We're going to see these people. There was still an introduction to this course, by the way. These people, the, the Anshe Knesset Gadolam, were the ones who wrote down the Amida and the prayer service. They're the ones who put it together. These are going to include great prophets and great people. We're going to see who they were. We're going to meet a few of them because some of them are really important to understand to fill up. There was 130 of them. Okay? So he was among them. And he said, I'm just mentioning this now because he's going to use that word. That the Shlosha Devarim, the world stands on three things. It's a Mishnah in Perkei Avot. The world stands on the low threes today. It's like Sesame Street. Today is brought to you with the letter Bet, Aleph, and the number three. The world stands on three things. What are those three things? On Torah, on Avoda, and Gemilut Chasadim. Chasadim. With acts of kindness. That is the Mishnah. Oh, hello! Experts in prayer and Hebrew words. What stands out over here? What's standing out? Avodah. I know that word. That word comes from the Torah. The Rambam told us from the Gemara that that word is actually service of the heart, prayer. That is learning Torah. And that is mitzvah between people. So now, we've lifted prayer into a whole category of its own. It's not Torah, and it's not really part of Gimel Chasadim. It's its own area. And you may have heard this before, I'm sure. But now we have three relationships that we're always trying to work on. A relationship through Torah, Avodah, and Gimel Chasadim. Meaning, Torah is God speaking to us. Avodah, if you will, is that speaking to Hashem? Because every relationship must have two-way communication. If it's not having two-way communication, it's not a relationship, it's a dictatorship. And Gimel Chasadim is us relating to other people. You heard that before? Very important. Get that? Great, right? Three relationships. Each one is crucial. The Torah is God speaking to us through the prophet Moshe Rabbeinu on how to do mitzvah. Avodah is prayer as well as being its own mitzvah. It's also a relationship builder, an emunah builder, and of course, Gimel Chasadim is us relating to each other. Boom. Drop the mic. That was so We've been done. We did a lot today. Wow. Thank you so much, Rabbi. You're welcome. Thank you. you are more than welcome, Anya. Great job. I'll see you all, God willing, inshallah. On Thursday, if you are able to put a special